Hey everybody, that <laughs> just caught me with my tongue out. Uh, this is Kyle with Confident Canines, and today we're talking about the training ceiling. I almost forgot. Uh, we're talking about the training ceiling, and so what that means, every dog is different, right? Every dog that, that you train is gonna be different. And what, you know, they're gonna have, they're gonna be different ages, which means whatever they've been doing it, whatever they've been doing that you don't like, they may have been doing it for a month, if they're a six month old dog, they may have been doing it for eight years if they're an eight or a nine year old dog. Um, both, both situations in which you can address the issues, but it's a different scenario if your dog's been doing something for a month or they've been doing it for six, seven, eight years. Um, and they're going to have different genetics. They're going to have different predispositions. They're going to have different experiences during their socialization periods uh, when they were a puppy and then an adolescent. Um, they're going to have you know different backgrounds and different triggers um, and all those things so what does that have to do with the training ceiling uh, what it means is that not every dog is going to have the same potential as another dog um, a lot of this is going to come down to when you started training if you start training at eight weeks you're gonna maximize potential certainly for the dog that you have um, they're still gonna have a ceiling but if you start training at eight weeks versus five years, there's gonna be a huge difference in what you're able to achieve very often. Um, again, depending on what issues your dog has. Um, genetics are another huge component of that. Probably the biggest component when we're talking about a training ceiling is gonna be genetics. That's gonna, because you can't change that. You can't change your dog's genetics. And if they have a strong predisposition to being a fearful dog, or towards being an anxious dog, or maybe even an aggressive dog, you know, um, it doesn't mean that's not stuff you can work with and get really good results with, but it does mean that, you know, not every dog, you know, to put it, to put it, you know, another way, not every dog can be like a high level service dog. You see like service dogs that go to places like Disney World and can just like take a nap, you know, um, uh, dogs who can perform a multitude of tasks. Uh, around incredibly high levels of distraction, you know, dogs who can have, you know, specialized responses to medical emergencies, again, around incredibly high levels of distraction. Those are dogs with very high ceilings. Um, it, typically what you'll find though is that those are dogs who, number one, were trained from day one, you know, um, on, on how to start, you know, being this type of service dog. Uh, but number two, they're usually specifically bred and they're very specially bred for that task. Why? Because genetics matter. Um, and the people who are raising these puppies know that if they start a dog with inferior genetics, they're never going to get where they go, even though they have all the training skills in the world and they've done this, you know, they might have all this experience and they know what they're doing. That doesn't mean they can just take a dog with inferior genetics and turn it into a high level uh, performing service dog. Um, the same thing with like you know, bomb dogs, detection dogs, you know, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, just really high performing um, dog. And certainly we're not talking about like all dogs who perform specialized tasks, but very often when you see dogs doing those um, really impressive things, uh, they have very robust genetics and they were probably specifically bred by experienced breeders to perform that task. And I just don't mean they're just that breed. I mean, like, oh, it's a German Shepherd, so all German Shepherds can do that. No, <laughs> you know, they are a specific, uh, specifically bred German Shepherd, you know, from, from, you know, a line that probably goes way back, a working line, um, to have high drive, to have high intelligence, to be able to uh, withstand high levels of pressure. Um, and so those are dogs with very, very high ceilings. Now, that's not what we're gonna see. I mean, most of you have, who have pet dogs, um, who are coming to me for training. I don't do that kind of training. I do family pet dog training. So most of you don't have a dog like that. You don't have a dog with an impossibly high ceiling. Um, but you might have a dog with a, a very, you know, reasonably high ceiling, but you might also have a dog with a reasonably low ceiling. Um, some dogs are just going to struggle. And I don't mean, you know, again, that's not to say they won't benefit from training. They'll probably benefit from training even more um, because they're, they're so predisposed to struggle. Um, but if you have a, 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 a soft dog, you know, um, all the training in the world isn't going to turn them into a very robust, uh, fearless, uh, nothing, you know, bomb proof, nothing intimidates me type of dog. They can certainly become a dog that, uh, it feels a lot more comfortable in around high levels of distraction and around high levels of pressure. Um, that defers to you for guidance instead of making their own decisions to like panic or freak out or hide. 
Uh, maybe they have that impulse, but they look to you because they've been trained and they say, what do you want me to do? And you say, hey, follow me in a heel or hold it down or, or do this or that. Um, so those are the types of things that you do to address it. But it's just important to always keep in mind that the dog that you have, you can't compare your dog to everyone else's dog because your dog is a complete unique little snowflake uh, with his own history or her own genetics, uh, her own predispositions um, and, and her own struggles. Um, and, and it's just something to always keep in mind that you, 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 you not, you, this, and a lot of times, you know, especially with like social media and stuff that, you know, if you see like these super high performing dogs, uh, and you have, uh, a six year old dog that's been struggling with massive levels of anxiety, um, you know, they're probably not going to be, uh, a service dog, you know, it, depending on what you mean by service dog, but a high performing service dog. Um, so. That is basically what the training ceiling is. Um, I feel like I've rambled a lot here. <laughs> hopefully that, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, if you have any questions, hit me up in the comments. I'll be happy to uh, clarify anything um, that I've said. Certainly, you know, the takeaway from this video, I don't want you to feel like, oh, my dog can't improve. That's not what I'm saying. Your dog can certainly improve. Um, trainers, myself included, have worked with dogs who have extreme issues that they struggle greatly um, this is all about setting realistic expectations for the improvement that your dog will make um, which which will be greatly improved through good training um, it's just to be realistic that you know if you have a very troubled dog who has a lot of anxiety that doesn't mean that they can just become this just completely different dog who has not, not a care in the world or something like that and is just completely bomb proof. That might not happen, but it might. Who knows? Where do you find out how what your, what your dog's ceiling is like? You start training and you see what happens and you keep working towards improvements and you see where your dog continues to struggle and you find holes in the training and you work on those. You just keep moving forward. You know, you're not going to get that from a DNA test and be like, well, where am I, where's my dog's ceiling? Like, how much can I train him? You're not going to be able to find that. How do you find out? You just start training and you start working your dog and you make him better and you put them around different situations and, and you go slow. You know, um, training, you, you don't want to move too fast with this stuff. Again, that's why, you know, we do a, a multi-week board and train here is because, you know, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. Um, and you just keep going with it and you just see, see how your dog responds to training. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, I hope maybe that helps take some pressure off some people who might be, you know, doing a lot of training with their dog and, and wondering, you know, why their dog still struggle, struggles in certain situations. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing anything wrong. Um, it just means that your dog is reaching, you know, maybe their limits of, of, of what they can handle, you know. So I'm going to stop. Um, again, it's Kyle with Confident Canines. Um, hit me up in the comments if you have any questions. Like and share this video if you think it'll help people. And I'll see you next time. And thank you for watching.